please welcome our next speaker, Cornell University's Dr. Karen Levy. Hi, everyone. Nice to join you all today. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Thanks so much for inviting me to come speak with you. Um, it looks like a great, amazing lineup of, of programming you all have for the next few days, and I'm really honored that you let me come be a part of it. Um, so I am a professor at Cornell University. I'm a lawyer and a sociologist, but more sociologist than lawyer, uh, and I study surveillance and privacy. And I study surveillance in a variety of settings, but there's a common thread that I've kind of accidentally discovered that seems to run through everything that I do um, which I didn't set out to do research about this, but it seems like it just keeps coming back to me. Um, and I thought I would talk with you about it today, and that common thread is intimacy. Um, so surveillance is bound up with our intimate lives in a bunch of different ways, and I thought I would tell you three short stories today from my research, from different projects I'm working on, about different ways that intimacy emerges in relation to data and surveillance. So first I thought I would talk to you about care, um, some work that I'm doing with a collaborator about surveillance in homes and in families, which I know is something that many of you think about a lot. Then I thought I'd talk with you about surveillance in bodies in relation to some research I'm doing about workplace surveillance, especially with long-haul truck drivers um, and automation in that industry. And then finally, I want to talk with you a little bit about violence um, and some research I'm doing about intimacy and abuse. So let's start with care. That's kind of the most fun one, probably. Um, in some of my work, we've been looking at how surveillance products are marketed to consumers for surveillance of people in their own homes, in their families, in their romantic relationships, in the intimate spheres of their lives. And these are tools that many of you are familiar with, right? Things like in-home camera and security systems, baby monitors, fertility trackers, location trackers for kids, for teenagers, a lot of the new IoT devices um, that many of the big tech companies are putting out. These products are all things you can buy on Amazon. They range in price from about $40 to about $400. And can you guess what they all have in common? They're all cameras. They're all hidden cameras. They're just cameras in different decoy type shapes. So these types of things. This on the right is the Sproutling. That's um, one of many. There's a bunch of different kind of products in this space. But this is an ankle monitor for an infant. And it monitors an infant's heart rate, temperature, the ambient light and sound in the room. There's a bunch of different products that monitor different stuff about babies. Um, and that, of course, like what we tend to think of when we think of an ankle bracelet is the one on the left, right? And so what we're suggesting in some of this work that we're doing is that actually more and more surveillance is looking like the ankle monitor on the right, right? And, and the, the interpretation we have of that is that surveillance is becoming a really normalized mode of taking care of one another, right? Not necessarily always punitive, sometimes based in care. And there's a lot of this I found really interesting because in the privacy research sphere, there's a lot of emphasis on how a bunch of data is being collected about all of us, right? How we're all being watched. But there's less emphasis on this other dynamic, which is how we're all becoming watchers. And that is what's for sale with products like this, right? So the idea is that surveillance is becoming normatively essential, really required to the duties of care that you have across the life cycle, right? Whether that's your role as a parent, as a child, as a spouse. And if you look at the rhetorics that get, mar get used to market this stuff, all of the rhetoric, all of the advertising language is about love and care and protection and safety and duty, right? We watch because we care. You watch out over your baby, and we as a tech company will help you do that. You can offload some of that burden of care onto us. And using that product reflects on you and the relationship that you have with, say, a child. And this extends all across the life cycle, right? So I showed you some stuff about babies. There's feed, a lot of fetal monitoring that's kind of, you can read in the same sphere, all the way up to elderly adults. So I have some other work about, about monitoring el elderly people. Now, for someone who studies surveillance like me, I find this to be one of the most interesting and normatively difficult areas. I have two young children. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And I totally understand the impetus to monitor them, right, to collect data about them. I'm sure I will in different ways as they grow up and they start driving and texting and doing all kinds of stuff I probably don't want them to do. And I'm not suggesting that this interest or this, this desire to monitor is misplaced or that these tools can't actually do a lot of good for families. But what I think is important to note about these is this. To sell protection and care, you also have to create a reciprocal anxiety. You have to sell an anxiety. 
about what you're being protected from. And so this is what happens if you look at this marketing. This marketing cultivates a generalized anxiety about the big bad world of threats. And some of those threats are external, things like worrying that your house is going to be robbed or that you're going to be assaulted. And some of them are internal, that your baby has some illness that you won't know about unless you buy this device. And actually, this is an old advertising trick. So where what's for sale is not just comfort, but also the discomfort that's relieved by the product that you buy. The packaging of discomfort and comfort together. So we tend to buy pain. The first example of this that I know of was the toothpaste Pepsodent, which is an old tooth. I don't actually know if they even sell Pepsodent anymore. But when they started selling Pepsodent, it was one of the most successful early toothpastes. And the reason was not because it cleaned your teeth any better than the other toothpaste on the market, but because it hurt to use. Like it made your mouth, I think, sting. I think it was like really, really minty or something. Um, so people thought it was doing a better job than the others, right? It created this pain and then it made people believe that it was really working, right? You package the pain and, and the relief together. The other thing that I find interesting about these tools is that there's kind of a backward compatibility to the way we talk about surveillance and care. So increasingly we see companies and states using this language of love and care to justify their own surveillance. So this comes from a public university, a friend of mine took this, right? But there's a bunch of examples of, of this, of states using this language of care. Okay, so that's this first little tidbit. The second little snapshot I thought I would share with you has to do with some of my, long for me, long-standing research about workplace surveillance. So I'm sure you have all heard, because you're all educated people concerned about technology, that there's a lot of well-founded concern lately about the possibility that AI is going to bring about massive disruption in employment, right? That millions of workers are suddenly going to lose their jobs, they won't have the ability to, to make ends meet, and there's a bunch of discussion about what's the extent of the disruption going to be, what sorts of jobs face the greatest threat. Now, one of the prime targets, everybody seems to agree, is likely to be long-haul truck driving. And there are several reasons for this. Some of them are technical, right? There's been a lot of technical innovation in the sphere of autonomous vehicles lately. Autonomous vehicles are best at highway driving, which trucks do a lot of. But then there's also some other factors, which I explore a lot in my research, which have to do with the fact that truck drivers are often very, they're really overworked, and they're really tired based on the political economy of the industry. And so they get really tired, and they get in these expensive and deadly accidents. And machines don't, right? Machines don't get tired. So there's, there's some kind of a push factor there, too. Now, economists worry a lot about this, this economic impact, right? There are about 2 million long-haul truckers in the United States. I don't know if any of you have seen this graphic. NPR put this out about a year ago. This is showing the most common job in every state. And all of those kind of, like the biggest one, all the aqua-colored states, the most common job in that state is truck driver. And so the common rhetoric, the like, very common concern about this now is what happens if all of those jobs are lost? Now, I've spent the last six years studying the role of technology in truck driving. That's what I wrote my dissertation about. Um, and I'm working on a book about it now, actually. And there is a threat from automation there, to be sure. But I believe that the rhetoric about massive job loss doesn't capture the whole nature of the threat, OK? So I don't think we're going to see this discrete phase transition from humans to robots in the trucking workplace, right? It's not like it goes human, 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 robot. Right, that's not how it works. Instead, it's gonna be this much more gradual curve, right? Because being a truck driver actually involves a whole lot of things that aren't just driving, right? You have to interface with customers, you have to secure your load, you have to make repairs, you have to load freight, all kinds of stuff that's harder to automate, right, than highway driving. And hence, might be automatable someday, but it's gonna come later, right? So the idea is that it's not likely that we won't have truck drivers at all, but it is likely that the nature of truck driving will change. And probably what will happen is that we'll require human truck drivers, human workers, to integrate their work with the technology in new ways. Now, we sometimes think about this, a lot of people in autonomous vehicles think about this as what they call the handoff problem, right? That humans and machines pass the baton back and forth, basically, and we kind of discreetly parcel out which functions the human's good at and which function the robot's good at. But what we actually see happening in trucking today is not a discrete parceling out. Instead, what we see is the integration of the human and the robot into one another in a very physical way. So in practice, the way workers are actually experiencing the rise of AI in trucking right now isn't this displacement, but is this very gradual physical intrusion into their work and their bodies. Now, this is a cartoon from a trucker magazine. I never thought I was going to spend a bunch of time reading trucker magazines, but there you go. I, I do that now. Um, so this is a robo-trucker. 
And this article is about, in, in the Trucker Magazine, is about some of these systems, right? And I'm going to tell you about a few of the examples that come up in this article and in some, other, some of my other work. So Mercedes recently announced that they're working on a vest for truck drivers that they wear, and it monitors their heart rate and their other vital signs. And the idea is that the vest knows if the trucker is going to have a heart attack, and if so, it stops the truck automatically. This is a company called Seeing Machines. It's one of kind of several companies that do use driver-facing cameras to monitor signs of fatigue. Now, Seeing Machines does this by monitoring a driver's eyelids, looking at the movement of a driver's eyelids and the, the direction of his eyes. And if his eyes close or he looks away from the road, it'll send an alert to his boss. It gets logged on his record. And this is my favorite part. It'll cause the driver's seat to vibrate to kind of like goose him back into attention. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's what happens. These drivers are wearing the smart cap, which is meant to detect fatigue by monitoring a driver's brain waves. So it's basically doing an EEG. And if you get tired, it can sound an alarm. It will text your manager. It can also be programmed to text your family members. So there are other systems too, right? Some companies use predictive analytics to determine a driver's likelihood of being involved in a crash, using not only driving data, but other information about what's happening in his life, like if he got a pay change or he started driving at a different time in the morning lately, things like that. <clears throat> So the key point I want to make about this is the distance between these two types of threat, right? And I think both are real threats. But we tend to hear this narrative of displacement without necessarily recognizing this other threat of intrusion. So the question of displacement isn't the only important thing to understand here. We should also think about how in this work, the intrusion of AI is very intimate and very much about bodies, right? Very much about a truck driver's body. It's this forced hybridization that really changes the nature of the work that remains. OK, last little snapshot. This is, as, to the extent I have a greatest hits, this is the greatest hits. It's only three songs. <laughs> um, OK, the last thing I want to tell you about is a newer project I'm working on, an interdisciplinary project I'm doing with a bunch of researchers at Cornell, where I work now, um, including, and, and at NYU, including some experts in cybersecurity and in human-computer interaction. And in this project, we're looking at the role of technology in intimate partner violence. Now, there are a lot of components to the work we're doing. There are a bunch of researchers on the project, but I'm just going to tell you about a little slice of it. So we know that intimate partner violence is a really pervasive problem faced by about 10% of men and about a quarter of women in the United States um, that have suffered rape, physical violence, or stalking at the hands of an intimate partner. And we know also that technology plays a really big and growing role in this. So in the course of the last year, we've been wrapping up a study at intimate violence shelters in New York City. And we've learned a lot of really depressing information about the many ways that people use technology to victimize other people with whom they had or are having intimate relationships. And some of this has gotten some play in the media, and you're likely familiar with some of it, things like harassment via social media, the exposure of private information or images, things like revenge porn. And it's clear that victims have a really hard time getting legal action that addresses those problems for them or getting platforms to help them out. But what I want to talk with you about today is this other kind of aspect of it that has become clear to us and that I found really interesting, which is how different intimate partner violence is from other types of privacy and security threats that we more commonly think about. So there are a lot of technologists that are becoming really enthusiastic about intervening in the context of domestic violence, which is great. But there are some perils right, to treating intimate partner violence like the other contexts in which we think about privacy and security. And there are unique ethical and design challenges that arise when your threat is intimate and physically co-present and has access to your devices and has access to your body. So it's different than these other contexts in which we normally think of digital threats as physically remote, usually. So we need to kind of threat model differently in this case. That's kind of the work we're doing. And I want to highlight a few distinctions between intimate partner violence and other contexts. The first is what we sometimes call the peril of the blank slate. So often in privacy and security, if your integrity has been compromised, a pretty straightforward of advice is, well, close your account, right? Reopen a new one, cut up your credit card, change your password, take some steps to disconnect or to insulate yourself from the invasion. But in the context of intimate partner violence, that's a super fraught advice for several reasons. So first, disconnection can greatly escalate your bodily risk. So this is a quote from a social worker in New York City who told us, Disconnecting often makes it worse. Her clients were much more at risk when they actually separate from their abusers because suddenly the abuser no longer has any control over the victim. So the only thing the abuser has left is the phone. And if you change your number, 
he's most likely going to go crazy, and that's when he's going to start stalking you any way he can. So weirdly, and sort of counterintuitively, in some sense, you might actually not want to overprotect yourself against tech-mediated abuse if the risk is that that's going to lead to other vectors of abuse, like physical or sexual abuse. The deletion of abus abusive material can also make it harder for victims to do things like retain evidence that they need for prosecution. It can cut off social support that they need to further kind of help them get out of the relationship, right? And plus, you may actually need to make, maintain contact with your abuser if you have things like children that you have joint custody of. Another difference is that when your adversary is intimate, it totally changes the nature of what it means to be authenticated. So in most contexts, we tend to think of an attacker who doesn't probably know you personally and is connecting from somewhere else, right? Connecting re remotely. But in intimate partner violence, an attacker can compel disclosure of things like your access credentials super easily and might have physical access to your device and your accounts by the nature of the relationship that you're in with them, right? So in many cases, Things like phones, right? Like an abuser, or a, uh, excuse me, a survivor would tell us, oh, well, my abuser has access to the phone because it's his phone. He bought the phone, right? Or we have a family plan, and so my abuser has access to all my communications data because he can see that, right, on the account page. Um, he can also very likely guess the answers to your security questions. He probably has your password. Or if he doesn't, he can physically threaten you to get it. So the sort of obvious privacy and security solutions don't work here because of the context. Something like an access credential is almost meaningless to people in these situations. Now, this other big issue that we're also looking at is spyware. So there's a bunch of concern, right, about the installation of spyware apps that detect things like location and communications data and lots of other information, and which are often really explicitly marketed towards abusive partners. But there's this other big issue that I think is less noticed, which has to do with what we call dual-use apps. So these are things that are really common that all of us probably have and use. Things like find my phone or find my friends or some of the parental trackers for kids that I alluded to earlier, right? Many of which can also be used for surreptitious tracking. So our research shows that the advertising often suggests these uses. So if you search, for example, on the Google Play Store for track cheating boyfriend, the first advertised thing that comes up is a parental tracker, right? Because you can use that for that purpose. So the key here, though, is that this is off-the-shelf software, right? This doesn't require you to be some crazy hacker that can, you know, root the phone or use some great software exploit. You don't have to have great technical skill to do this. This isn't, this isn't really hacking. Now, all of this work has led us to develop a new model that we're calling the UI-bound adversary, which we're defining as being an authenticated adversarial user of a system who carries out attacks using basically just standard user interfaces, right? Pretty untechnically sophisticated attacks, but they're really complicated to mitigate, right? Because of the social and relational context around them. So now we're doing work to see if we can develop tools to better characterize behaviors that are unique to abusers, to better detect spyware on phones. And then we're also thinking about how to design and evaluate user interfaces better in light of this model. So I'll tell you just a little bit about one little thought about the, the user interface part. And this isn't intended to address all of the stuff I just told you about, but it's just one example. So one, I know this seems like a weird slide to put up after everything I just told you, but one potential way to address some of these threats is by building apps that hide what they really are. So some people call that a steganographic approach. And my thinking here is influenced, maybe surprisingly, by the NCAA tournament. It's a silly example, but I think it makes the point. So during the first round of March Madness, or like how many people watch March Madness? There are some people, whenever I talk to academics, like nobody watches <laughs> basketball, so I'm glad that you guys actually maybe know what that is. So it's this big basketball tournament, right? And in the first round, there are like 32 games-ish to get through, and a lot of them are on during the day, right? And so people want to watch them. There's this documented productivity drop in American companies during the first few days of the tournament every year, because um, people want to watch. And so because they're on during the day, people have to watch at work. And there are streaming options now available that let you do that. So since people need to watch basketball at work, need to watch basketball at work, they need a good way to do that on the sly, right? They need a good way to easily get cover for what they're doing with something kind of worky. So I wonder if any of you can actually see, or maybe you know because you've done this, um, what on this slide indicates kind of a surreptitious like escape hatch. The boss button, there it is, the boss button. So yeah, in the upper right hand corner, there's this little tiny button that says boss button, which you click when the boss is walking by, and this comes up. 
which, you know, looks like pretty worky, like whatever your line of work is, probably there's some graphs. So the NCAA has been doing, there's like a great article that shows like what the boss button is brought up each year, and each year it's some variation on this essentially. They eventually branded them, they got like sponsors to do the boss button. They put jokes in them. Some computer games have something similar. It's, it's a decoy, right, to avoid getting caught screwing around at work, right? And it's kind of like a fun, it's funny. But I think it actually gets at a really important idea, which is that in the context of trying to watch basketball at work, your adversary is physically co-present. Right? It's your boss. And they're looking over your shoulder. They're trying to see what you're doing with your device. And maybe they have like, some visual access, at least, to the device. So this, the, this idea actually has applicability for people in some dangerous situations where somebody else might similarly have kind of over-the-shoulder access to what you're doing. And there, this, is, so this is obviously just like one small kind of silly example. But there actually are a few sites in the, in the intimate partner violence context that use some kind of like escape button like this to try and let you get out really quickly. So the reason I told you these three stories, which might seem quite distinct from one another, is that you know, we often talk about datafication as being this really impersonal dynamic, right? this dynamic that somehow separates us from real life or from intimate life in some way. That's kind of the common media take about it. But obviously, data is not impersonal. right? Data is super personal and very intimate in a bunch of ways. It weaves itself, it weaves itself into our homes, into our workplaces, into our relationships. And sometimes it intrudes into our bodies, into the way we take care of one another, and even into the ways that we try to hurt one another. So beyond compliance, there are a bunch of ethical issues involved right, in how we design for our technologies if we think about how intimately those technologies affect us. And if we think especially about how they're going to get used in existing asymmetries of power. right? There are always power differentials in every context right, on the ground whether that's in the home, in the workplace, in an intimate relationship. And so I, I've been really interested in kind of thinking about that and thinking about how we can use technology to try and remediate some of those asymmetries. Um, and I really appreciate the chance to show these snapshots to you, and I wish you a really excellent conference. <laughs>